I think that's probably the hardest bit. I'm not very good with selfies. I'm too old. Um, thank you to Arlindo for the opportunity to speak here. Um, originally, my colleague Kirk Crock was going to give this presentation, but he wasn't able to uh, make the event, sadly, so I'm going to step in and give it on our company's behalf. The last question from the Admiral's presentation, it was a very good lead-in to uh, what the mission of the company DEEP aims to achieve. And it is exactly that question of habitation of the oceans, but subsea. So if we look on the left, we see the International Space Station. Now there are scientists living in space, studying and utilizing the vacuum and the zero gravity to gain knowledge this is not how space exploration started. If you go right back to the beginnings of Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo, every astronaut was an extremely experienced test pilot, military pilot, and they were the only people that had the opportunity to go to space. What happens now is the vast majority of crew on board the International Space Station are scientists, mission specialists. They, of course, take an appropriate amount of astronaut training to be able to get there, and then conduct their studies for time periods of up to a year and beyond. We aim um, by 2027 to do this subsea. Our first ocean deployment is scheduled for 2027. Prior to that, we will be deploying in our test facility, which we'll talk about shortly. So the aim is to have a habitable living environment at seabed pressure, on seabed, and most importantly, to be able to leave it do excursions and go out into the ocean to study, to learn. So our goal is not the first. Subsea habitats have existed for many years. There's a selection of them here from the early Cousteau conshelf submersibles and right through till the Aquarius reef base, which still exists today. Sadly, damaged by the last uh, hurricane, but still in place off of Key Largo in Florida. The aim of these really is they are at atmospheric pressure. So whichever depth they're placed at, the inside is the same pressure as the outside. So the occupants are effectively saturated. They've been pressurized to that depth for long enough that they can't absorb any more inert gas and they can now stay there indefinitely with the same decompression penalty at the end. Most of these early habitats, certainly the Sea Lab system, existed to let us learn how to safely conduct saturation diving. And after this knowledge was acquired, what then happened is most saturation diving was done from surface. So a DSV with a saturation living environment, a closed bell that could be locked from that, lowered to seabed, and divers achieve work, mostly for oil and gas and military. What we aim to do is give scientists the ability to live subsea, continue their research, and not have those constraints. So our system is called Sentinel. Um, this is a multi-node Sentinel graphic. So if you see each of these components, it's made up of a dome on each end and a ring in the center. The core component is a free ring, two dome, sitting horizontally, but it is modular. So you can add as many of these together as you wish to create, as the question, a subsea city. Moon pools enable access to the water, so the divers can exit. The plan at this time is for those divers always to be tethered, because given the nature of the environment, it would be impossible for a diver to ascend to surface whilst living in this, so they need to have a guarantee of returning to the moon pool. Obviously, in that scenario, the diving equipment they use will be backed up on multiple levels, so in the event of a failure, they can still safely return to that moon pool. And then there will be multiple means of exiting the habitat in the event of any given emergency, either to ad additional habitat, subsea, or back to surface under pressure in a variety of means that we shall cover. So the idea of subsea living is, at the moment, if we look at traditional diving, so myself, for example, doing projects for people like the DPAA, even in just something as shallow as 70 meters. The divers go down, they get 30 minutes of work. For that, they pay with two plus hours of decompression, and that they get to do once a day. It's really, from a ratio point of view, not very productive. The idea of living in a habitat is a scientist will be able to go out and conduct 
one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour dives, multiple times a day, whatever they need to do. Come back inside, live in comfort. So I'm sure many of you in the room have either been to Aquarius or seen it, certainly images. It is not luxurious, it is not comfortable. It's a small tin on the seabed. It smells quite bad. It's very humid, it's very damp. We aim to separate the Sentinel into two areas, the living and science area and the dive center area. Those two areas won't be in different pressures, they'll just be firmly sealed with an environmental control unit. So you are looking at this degree of comfort and size, individual cabins for the scientists and the crew. The aim is a six-man crew, one Habitat commander, one two IC, and four mission specialists. So these are scientists that will be trained to operate within the system. This gives us much more productive time to engage with the environment. What are the potential uses? Pharmacology, research for chemicals, substances that can be found subsea to aid in medicines, but most importantly, protecting the oceans, learning about the oceans. The aim of Sentinel and the aim of Deep is a scientific approach. So it's not designed to be used for oil and gas or anything that would take from the ocean. The idea is to be able to give back to the ocean and to protect the ocean. So the system is modular. On the left at the bottom is a single node Sentinel. This will of course be the first unit deployed. We'll deploy this in our training facility and then we'll move on to putting it into the ocean, at which point they can be connected in a variety of different ways. So we have a trio, you have three nodes and then three upright nodes. You then have this, uh, the uh, option to add more segments to this. And this is exactly the way the International Space Station was built, piece by piece, lab by lab, component by component, so it can grow. The idea of Sentinel is it's not designed to be put in one place and left there. The foundation that it will stand on, you can see in the top diagram there, is being constructed in such a manner that it is ecologically um, safe materials and can be left to effectively grow into an artificial reef. So it will be built like some of these artificial reefs that are being around the world to encourage marine growth. And then the option exists to remove the habitat, leave the foundation for that purpose, if permits and that host nation permit, and if not, that foundation can be lifted by a commercial team after the Sentinel has moved. The idea with the habitat, of course, being a habitat, it will be at the same atmospheric pressure as the depth the divers will be at. However, it has the capability of being decompressed back to surface while still subsea. So at the end of the mission, the moon pool can be closed. The whole system can gradually be decompressed so that scientists can continue with their research, writing their papers in comfort, right up to the point they can join the sub, go back to surface and exit. So we're hoping they won't have to sit in a small scramp space for several days to decompress. So just to give you an idea of size, um, it's big. So there's a commercial airliner there in the middle, and we see a single node sentinel representing approximately half that size. It's 17 meters long, six meters diameter, and that's just for the habitat itself. It excludes the foundation or anything else along those lines. The three rings in the middle, they make it even more um, configurable because we can put in four or five or six. The free ring system created for a six-man crew. The end domes both contain moon pools. So there's a primary moon pool in the dive center. There's an emergency moon pool in the Grand Hall, which is not normally used, but it could be an emergency. The viewports are two meters in diameter, and they go around the entire ring. So this is literally flooded with light. You know, when you're on seabed, then you're able to see all the way out above you, all the way around. Now, of course, depth-wise, the aim of the Sentinel, it's being designed and manufactured to work from surface to 200 meters. We're doing this by enabling it to have the capability to be atmospheric or to be surface pressure. Depth-wise, it gives us the ability to put it in a variety of different environments that scientists or scientific institutions wish it to be in. The idea is continental shelf and everything above that. So its actual deployment depth would depend on the client or the required task. This is our training facility. So um, some of you in the room will probably fondly remember this. I know Mark will. 
Um, we purchased this when we set up two years ago. On the right-hand side of the lake, um, the bottom is approximately 75 meters deep at the deepest level. It is a stone quarry, so it's kind of V-shaped like a fjord, so the bottom is not flat. So with the size of Sentinel, we'll be comfortably able to deploy it down to 60 meters in here. We have other uses for the quarry as well. So the bottom picture is what we call our sub-island. So in the top picture, you can just see the island from above. We have two Triton 3K3s here, and mainly this is just for um, safety training, pilot training, sub-rescue training in preparation. You'll see in a moment that we are building our own submersibles as well, because although the 3K3s are excellent, what we need is something that can join onto the Sentinel to transport the occupants to it and back from it. The way the Sentinel would be deployed in here is on a jack-up barge. So there'll basically be a legged jack-up platform. Sentinel will be able to be assembled on surface, then lowered down to test depths, unmanned first, and then eventually manned. And this, of course, follows the route of safety only. So from day one, we were working with DNV as a classer. So basically, these are the people that uh, classed the limiting factor and the drop for Vescovo's Five Ocean mission. So from day one, we invited them in to say, we want to do this, it has to be safe, how? So they regularly tell us that won't work, that won't work, try this, try this. Equally, we need to work towards the system to train people to use it. And this will become, hence the name, our campus, where that training will take place. The Deep Institute is the training platform for that. Again, bringing in people to help us develop this in the safest and legislatively covering manner, we've been consulting with UK health and safety executive as to how to train people to use this. Traditionally, the only type of person that could go into this environment would be a saturation diver, the highest level of commercial diving. Scientists, it's a bit like the mission specialists on the space station, that would be a little bit much and unnecessary. So we aim to create a habitat diver training program and the tagline we're using is to make humans aquatic, as per your question. Subsea habitation, starting at the beginning. So at the moment, the method by which the diving will take place from the Sentinel, we're going to kind of reverse tradition. A lot of deep water commercial diving is done by reclaim surface supply. So the gas goes from the surface, down to the closed bell, out to the diver, back to the closed bell, back to the surface, the CO2 is removed, the gas is replenished requires a lot of power. It's not very reliable in shallow water. It's a little bit uh, niggly in deep water. And because the Sentinel will be independent, sit subsea on its own, no surface buoy, we can't do that because we don't have the pressure differential or the power. So what we aim to do is reverse it. The diver's primary equipment will be closed circuit rebreather. Um, the exact system, because it's probably a question that will come, is yet as yet undefined. At the moment, for the training process in the quarry, we're using the JJCCR with modifications. Eventually, the divers will be on CCR, but they will have surface applied gas, not from the surface, but from the habitat, as their backup. They will then have traditional open circuit as a third degree of backup, and then the supporting ROV will contain spare gas as well. So we're looking at multiple levels of redundancy to ensure that the diver can always get back to the habitat and safely re-enter the system. The training goes right from the beginning of mindfulness and well-being all the way through to that saturation idea. To do this, we are building a network. You may be wondering or thinking, who's going to use this? Who can afford it? Um, so we aim two goals. There are institutions we're already working with, such as Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Pristine Seas, and for institutions like universities, etc., we're in a position to be able to offer this service, this habitat system, to good science, ocean protective science. There are other classes of user that would need this for specific work that we would basically rent the system, sell the system to. But we are not currently looking for funding. We are funded independently to achieve all of this ourselves, and then we will look at users um, in the future lots of people already interested in that from our point of view. So the idea of the Aqua Network is this training system right from a non-diver who is a scientist through to a habitat diver able to live in and work in this environment is we can provide a training system all the way through. 
from already experienced divers like saturation divers, effectively a type of crossover, or from people in the middle like CCR tech divers, we can put in what they need to fill in the gaps to be able to go into the habitat and operate with the team. To get there, we are designing and building our own subs. Again, working with DNV on this, uh, we're in an advanced state of pre-manufacture with the Odin. The Odin is a multi-person um, lockout submersible. It's effectively a tractor. The box on the back with the logo on it is effectively a module. Now that module could be the equivalent of a closed bell. That is our main plan for delivery to and removal from the Sentinel for the dive teams. It will also be um, a refuge as such. So on that Sentinel on the roof, there will be one of these parked permanently. There'll be one of the rear modules parked on the other end. There'll be another one on legs on the seabed right by the moon pool. So in the event of a habitat failure or problem, for example, unbreathable atmosphere, the occupants have multiple options to go into either of the removable roof units or the floor units. All can return to safe surface safely. The other thing that the Odin can do is it can bring materials. So if you think like the um, NASA experiments done on Aquarius at NEMO, where they have work platforms outside to do tasks that replicate um, their missions in space, same thing. If a client has an experiment or experimental equipment or infrastructure, that system can be taken down by the Odin. At the moment, the Odin is being designed to support the Sentinel, so it's aimed at a slightly deeper than the 200 meter deployment to enable excursions from there. And this is one of a suite of submarines that we aim to produce over the coming years to complement and supplement the um, Sentinel's system. So thank you very much.